Good evening. My name is William Watkins, and I am Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 Freshman Convocation of California State University Northridge. I have the honor of serving as your narrator for this evening, and I ask now that you all please rise for our national anthem, performed by CSUN's Jazz A Band under the direction of Professor Matt Harris. and be seated. How about another cheer for Professor Harris and our Jazz A Band? Those are your fellow students. Tonight, a distinguished platform party has been assembled to welcome you, our newest members of the CSUN campus community. I ask that you all hold your applause until the entire platform party and special guests have been introduced. I also ask that each member of the platform rise and be recognized as I call your name. Starting in the second row, from my left to right, Vice Provost Dr. Michael Neubauer, Dean of the Singh College of Graduate International and Mid-Career Education, Ms. Joyce Foyt Javier, Dean of the Michael D. Eisner College of Education, Dr. Michael Spagna, Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Raji Rees, Associate Vice President of Undergraduate Studies, Dr. Elizabeth Adams, Director of Intercollegiate Athletics, Dr. Brandon Martin, Director of Equity and Diversity and Title IX Coordinator, Dr. Susan Waugh, Chair of the Department of Management and representing the D David Nazarian College of Business and Economics, P Professor David Miller, Associate Dean for the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Dr. Matthew Kahn, Interim Dean of the Michael Kerr College of Arts, Media, and Communication, Dr. Dan Hoskins, Dean of the College of Health and Human Development, Dr. Farrell Webb, Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science, Dr. S. K. Ramesh. Now in the front row, CSUN Alumni Association President, Mr. Carlos Fuentes, Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics, Dr. Jerry Stinner, Vice President for Administration and Finance, Mr. Colin Donahue, President, Chief of Staff, Ms. Jill Smith, your Associated Students President, Mr. Savag Alexanian, 2016 Diana F. Harrison Leadership Award recipient as, and CSUN student, Ms. Rose Merida. Yeah. 2016 Outstanding Graduate Speaker, Mr. Joshua Kabushani. President of our university, Dr. Diane Harrison. Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. E. Lee. Our keynote speaker, Mr. John Ronson. Yeah. Vice President for Information Technology, Ms. Hillary Baker. 
Dean of the College of Humanities, Dr. Elizabeth Say, Faculty Senate Vice President, Dr. Mary Pat, Pat Stein, pardon me, CSU student trustee, and we're very proud of him, Mr. George Reyes Salinas, and finally, Dean of the Oviatt Library and this evening's mace bearer, Dr. Mark Stover. Please join me in thanking this distinguished group. Thank you, you may be seated. I would like to also introduce and thank all of the associate deans who have served as our honor marshals, members of our faculty, and all of our campus department chairs, members of our student affairs and academic affairs division administrations, student leaders from the associated students and university student unions, student housing resident advisors, student athletes, and new student orientation leaders. Thank you for your participation this evening. Let's give them all a cheer. And now it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Diane Harrison, our university president. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. And on behalf of California State University Northridge, I am pleased to welcome all of you, our new freshman class, the class of 2020. As entering freshmen, and some of you who heard me at orientation know I like to give advice. So you're beginning a new and important chapter in your life. This chapter also brings a new independence for many of you. As young adults, you will find yourselves facing new choices, as well as new opportunities. Personal choices that you make will affect your future. By choosing to attend CSUN, you have made, in our view, a very important first step in this world of responsibility and choice by deciding to invest in your future and by getting a college education. Congratulations on taking this first important step for what I hope will be a unique and wonderful journey for each and every one of you. As you continue your college career, I encourage you to continue making good choices. Some choices will be very hard, but that is what college is about and why we, the faculty and the staff and the administrators of CSUN are here to help you as you grow and mature, provide guidance to you when you need it, in making good, smart choices and decisions as you prepare yourselves for careers and being responsible members of the community. This means choosing to be committed to your studies and attending class. Remember, how many of you have gone to every class so far that you were supposed to this semester? We better see all those hands. Good for you, you have to keep it up. You are now in control. You are accountable to yourself. So do the necessary planning, think ahead, and outside of the classroom, choose to be involved. Make the most of your college career. There's so many opportunities for you here to grow and to network Take advantage of our state-of-the-art Student Rec Center and the OASIS Wellness Center. Join an intramural sport team or some other student club. Get involved in our student government. Engage in service. Volunteer in the community. There are so many choices for you to become engaged and involved with this university, and that's what we want. We want you to be engaged and involved. We also hope you will become, choose to become responsible members of society and of your community. Be proactive in protecting the well-being and the safety of others. 
Tonight we will hear from John Ronson, the author of this year's Freshman Common Reading Book selection entitled, So You've Been Publicly Shamed. The book touches on the effect that we can have on others and in the world, both very positive and also very negative in using social media. His book reinforces for me the need to make responsible choices in our interconnected world. One of the things that I hope you will learn during your time here at CSUN as you progress in your education and become more informed about various issues is to listen and to acknowledge the views of others. This advice seems especially relevant in a presidential election year. You will encounter ideas and experiences different from your own. And of course, you are entitled to disagree. But I do hope that you will choose and learn to express your disagreement with reason, with thought, with tolerance, and with mutual respect. Diversity of thought and ideas is what has made our universities and our country great and the envy of all of the rest of the world. I hope that you will take this to heart as you embark on the journey that lies ahead of you here at this university and in the community. Let me conclude by saying that I want to assure you that the university's first priority is your success. The faculty, staff, and administrators at CSUN are focused on providing the programs, the resources, and the services to support you. But this effort must also be a partnership with you, our students, and depends greatly on the choices and the commitment to your own education and personal success. You are our future. You will innovate. You will do the research. You will solve the problems of our world. I know you will succeed because you're now part of the CSUN family. But to succeed and to achieve excellence, you will need to plan well, you will need to work hard, and you will need to make good choices. And we will be here to help you do it. And with that, I will ask you to please have a great first semester and a great freshman year. Thank you. Before going on, I want to just take a moment. I, you've heard us indicate that this is the, the 10th anniversary of our freshman convocation. And I'd like to ask a guest who's here right now who helped to found this event here at California State University Northridge. Tom Piernick, stand up and let's give him a cheer. Thank you. Each year at this event, a CSUN student or recent graduate is invited to share their thoughts and insights into creating a successful university life. These individuals are chosen for their exemplary scholarship and meaningful involvement both on campus and in the community. Mr. Joshua Kabushani, one of our CSUN's 2016 Outstanding Graduating Seniors, is serving in this distinguished role with us this evening. Joshua majored in philosophy and graduated this past May with a 3.8 grade point average. While at CSUN, Joshua assumed several leadership roles on campus. He served as a senator for Associated Students, was a new student orientation leader, and was a cast member in Take 24, and also made time to volunteer for United We Serve, our student volunteer organization. As a student, he joined the KCSN community, 
a member-supported public radio station broadcasting live from the CSUN campus. He also took advantage of the opportunity to study abroad and spent a semester in Europe and remarkably continued his volunteer work while abroad by facilitating wellness workshops within impoverished neighborhoods in Limerick. Ultimately, Josh wishes to be a widely read and published writer. Through words, he wants to connect with others. I present to you now Mr. Joshua Kabushani. To the Freshman Convocation Committee and the entire OSIT office, I feel both incredibly honored and privileged to have been invited uh, in this fine production of CSUN Tradition. To President Harrison, Dr. William Watkins, and the distinguished platform party with Iranian customs and more is very much alive in my heart. I feel inclined to apologize for standing with my back to you. Do forgive me. Looking up and out, I see both you the present, the fine class of 2020, and I see myself having sat exactly where you are now six years ago today. And although my being up here on this, on this stage, adorned in this gown, may suggest otherwise, I feel that we're one and the same, that I'm you and you're me, the only distance between us comprising of the, bin, the bit of hindsight that I've been afforded. Looking into the eyes of my 18-year-old self, I see my own future as I'm living it now. And so it turns out that the cliche isn't such a big cliche after all. Hindsight does indeed offer clarity. As I try to dig up a memory from my own freshman convocation on how I had an extraordinary experience, how I was moved to inspire and capture every iota of wisdom bequeathed to me by that year's keynote speaker, I was met by the harsh reality that in fact I spent the entire event brooding and wallowing in the recent icky ugly sadness of heartbreak and heartache. I sat clinging onto my seat, damn near certain I'd never crossed the stage set before me, the very stage that's been set before you now. And although it may be unlikely, it's not also not entirely impossible that you are swimming in your own lot of uncomfortable feelings. Nonetheless, you're here, you showed up, and for that alone, I applaud you, I admire you, and I'm encouraged by you. Really, I am. Thank you. My hope is that during your stay at CSUN, you'll seek and navigate through that infinite abyss, the sacred, unknown arena where the reality which you currently hold as the capital T truth will gain unforeseen depth and breadth, shattering that which it was previously confined by. In fact, prepubescent pre growing pains, the awkwardness of adolescence, those seemingly monumental high school pains will all pale in comparison to the challenges of university life. This shattering of your reality is going to sting, wickedly so. What's more, the really fortunate amongst you will experience this not just as one independent event, but as a reoccurring theme that's woven all throughout and within your education, presenting you with a chance to completely reconstruct your personhood, refining, 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 until you encounter the self you were meant to be. And truly, what a gem of a being will emerge from your depths. It'll be here where you'll discover that science has had it wrong all along, that breathing is not a function of the autonomic nervous system. No, it isn't, because you'll have to consciously and seriously inhale deeper and deeper and deeper, pulling in enough oxygen to mitigate the myriad of fears within your heart. One of those fears being that relationships you, pre you previously revered with the same sanctity as the stars have perished right before your eyes. And if you're like me, the challenge will be not, not to force your way into seams you've clearly outgrown, but to embrace the adventure of unforeseen new relationships. There are 45,000 possibilities amongst you. For a while, you'll be driven by the erroneous practice that tries to determine your value as a student, your worth as an intellectual, based off the grades on your transcript. And because of this, you'll rely on the habit of studying by rote, never fully ingesting, but merely swallowing and then regurgitating information soon to be forgotten. Yet, as matadors inevitably do, I have not an inkling of doubt that you too will capture what is truly the opportunity, the gift of a lifetime, to learn how to think and not merely what to think. 
You'll, be, you'll enrich and expand your intellect, a process which in of itself shall reveal the riveting truth that it's not so much a matter of how smart you are, but more so how much you care. And it's not so much about finding and discovering some infinite, unwavering passion. No, what the world needs of you, of us, is to listen and to really carefully watch for that which makes us curious. For the latter, curiosity is inexhaustible, universal, flexible, and can, if pursued, lead to paths which you never knew lay within you. Your place is here, and your moment is now, and the stage couldn't be any grander. And so I pass the pen to you, for you to write your own script, for you to ensure that the narrative of CSUN legacy continues to be told, where it is an undeniable fact that here at CSUN, you can be noticed. You have the chance to be seen, and not just as who you are, but seen as who you want to be, all the way down to your depths and all the way up. I humbly ask of you, class of 2020, to commence now, to begin inking in the conclusion you wish to read aloud when your time comes to gaze down the corridors of hindsight. I wish you more than luck. Thank you, Joshua, for your remarks to our freshmen. I hope you all heard his message and will take it seriously. And we wish you best wishes for your continued success as you continue charting your own career path. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to the campus the recipient of the Harrison Leadership Award for 2016. Each year, the university awards an $8,000 scholarship to a student who meets the following minimum criteria. The completion of the freshman year with 30 earned units of credit, at least a 3.0 grade point average, and demonstrated leadership ability. A number of outstanding students applied for the award this year, and I would like to acknowledge one of the finalists who joins us this evening. I would like to ask Connor Student, music major, to please stand and be recognized as one of our finalists. Congratulations. Connor is studying guitar. Thank you so much for your inspiring work that you've undertaken so far. You are a true model of success for our freshman class. And now I am pleased to introduce to you all the recipient of this year's Harrison Leadership Award, Rose Merida. Rose, will you join me right here? Rose Merida is an exceptional young woman who has excelled in her academic studies while establishing herself as a leader within our campus community. Rose is majoring in biology and participated in the Student Health Professionals pre-entry program. She is the vice president of a student organization that she helped to establish, works with Associated Students Productions, recently served as a new student orientation leader, and as a community volunteer for the East Valley Animals Shelter and the Grand Valley Healthcare Center. Rose has been motivated to do her best so she could make a difference for a campus she described as having given her a beautiful home away from home, comfort, strength, and love. In fact, during her interview for the award, she spoke about how the Spanish word Hogar comes to mind when she thinks of CSUN. Hogar, translated into English, means home. Rose, it is my strong hope that you will continue to help create a strong culture of involvement and leadership here at CSUN. Thank you for the many, many ways in which you have helped our CSUN rise. Thank you and congratulations.
I also want to congratulate Rose's mom and her younger brother who are here, and thank you. I hope that many of you seated here tonight will consider making the same commitment and apply for next year's Harrison Leadership Award. And while I'm sure the $8,000 is a good incentive, as Rose can tell you, a successful first year that puts you on track to graduate in four years, achieving an excellent GPA, and meeting the challenges and the opportunities of leadership on our campus is a reward in and of itself. I do hope that all of you will commit to applying for the award this spring. And now, I would like to welcome our university provost and vice president for academic affairs, Dr. E. Lee, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. It is my honor to welcome you to this great university and introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Mr. John Rawson. John Rawson is a gazelle journalist in the spirit of Hunt Sass Thompson, but with the comic heart of Monty Python. An award-winning writer and a documentary filmmaker, his unique brand of intellect and the comic weight has been described by comedian John Stewart as satirical investigation. He is a regular contributor to the BBC and NPR, and he is the author of eight books, including the best-selling The Psychopath Test, and most recently, So You Being Publicly shamed. In So You Are Being Publicly Shamed, Jiang investigates our obsession with the social media and its sometimes disastrous impact on our lives and the collective conscience. It is a timely and human account that has been selected by many communities and campuses as a community wide read and also serve as this year's CSUN freshman common reading book selection. NPR called the book a big hearted take on an important and a timely topic. So please join me in welcoming tonight's keynote speaker and the New York Times best selling author John Rawson. Hello. Oops. Hi. Thank you. I loved college. If you're thinking, I hope it's not going to be like high school, it's not. It's much better. My high school life had been terrible. In fact, not long ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and found I was still angry with the boys who threw me into Roth Park Lake in Cardiff in Wales in the summer of 1983 when I was 16. And so I went online, found one of them, and emailed to inform him that I am now a best-selling author. <laughs> he emailed me back to say that the reason why they threw me in the lake back then was because I was a pain in the ass, and the tenor of my email leads him to suspect that I haven't changed, <laughs> and that throwing me in the lake again today would be an appropriate response. So that didn't work out how I'd hoped. But I loved college. It was a place of adventure and freedom. I loved what you said about college being a place where finally you are in control. It's a place of adventure and freedom. It was where I found my confidence and my voice and my people. 
And I also found people who weren't my people, but they were very strange, and that was good too. I went to the Polytechnic of Central London. I'd stand in the kitchen doorway of my hall of residence and watch my roommate Shep smash all the crockery every time Arsenal lost. It's a football team. Sorry, a soccer team. He'd grab dirty cereal dishes from the sink and hurl them in a frenzy across the room, his dreadlocked hair tumbling into his face like he was some kind of disturbed Highland Games competitor or Dothraki from Game of Thrones. He's so mentally ill, I'd think with excitement. I was such an idiot, but then I became less of an idiot. For me, college was all about curiosity. It reminds me of the early days of social media. When Twitter began, we suddenly had access to a whole new bunch of people. It gave us a window into other people's lives, and we used it to be inquisitive. We chatted away unselfconsciously. We admitted shameful secrets about ourselves, and other people said, oh my God, I'm exactly the same. Ask any psychiatrist, and they'll tell you that a de-shaming environment like that is one of the most healing places there is. We got talking with people we'd never normally meet, people from a long way away. Some had been voiceless until social media came along. By voiceless, I mean that they were from marginalized communities, or maybe they were so socially awkward in real life that if you met them at a party, they basically had selective mutism. But on social media, they were funny and eloquent. I think all that intermingling on social media must have contributed to the world becoming a less bigoted place. How could a person still be racist or homophobic or misogynist or afraid of people with mental health issues when they chatted with them on social media and found them to be funny and smart and human? But then something happened. I think we fell in love with our awesomeness so much that when a transgressor came along, we felt compelled to get them. Fury at the terribleness of other people started consuming us a lot. In fact, it began to feel weird and empty when there wasn't somebody we could get. Soon the parameters of what we considered shameworthy grew wider and wider. It wasn't just transgressions we were watchful for, it was misspeakings. Instead of getting people who maybe deserved it, like powerful public figures and companies that had committed actual transgressions, we started getting private individuals that had, say, made a joke that came out badly. It became frightening. Instead of being a place to unselfconsciously share our shameful secrets, it was like the hunt was on for shameful secrets. And so instead of being curious and empathetic, we started being cold and judgmental. We'd tear into people furiously, like a machine frantically ejecting some destabilizing fragment. And that's where we are now. We ruin people on almost no evidence. In fact, waiting for evidence, waiting to hear the person's explanation for why they wrote that tweet is considered a weakness. We don't have to wait for their explanation. We know what they're like. Some bad wording in a tweet becomes a clue to that person's secret inner evil, which is a crazy way to think of our fellow humans. What's true about our fellow humans is that we're clever and we're stupid. We're a mess. We are gray areas. I want to tell you a couple of stories, one about closed-mindedness and one about open-mindedness. Here's the story about closed-mindedness. Not long ago, a train crashed in Philadelphia. Eight people were killed. A survivor emerged from the wreckage and tweeted, Thanks a lot for derailing my train. Can I please get my violin back from the second car of the train? This was a woman who had just been in a train crash. Twitter had the opportunity to offer her sympathy, to ask her anything, to ask her what it had been like. But Twitter didn't do that. Instead, Twitter responded, some spoiled idiot is whining about her violin being on that Amtrak that derailed. People died on that train. And she's an idiot. I hope her violin is crushed. And I hope someone picks it up and smacks it against the train. And screw that little bitch and her goddamn violin. I would slap the taste out of her mouth if she was in reach. 
And then after she deleted her Twitter account. Too bad she's a coward and deleted her account. How will her violin ever be returned? And I hope you get your violin back from under the bleeding people. Good luck. And your violin can be replaced. The dead are gone forever. And I won't be cutting her any slack. What a sickening skank. I hope her life is exactly what a nasty bitch deserves. And eight passengers dead, but she lives. No justice in the world. She was being publicly shamed because she was perceived to have misused her privilege. And of course, the misuse of privilege is a much better thing to get people for than the things we used to get people for, like having children out of wedlock. But a great number of people who hadn't just been in a train crash were now accusing a woman who had just been in a train crash of being privileged. This wasn't one of those super shamings where the person makes a joke that comes out badly and then they lose their job or commit suicide. There were lots of those stories I can tell you. And in fact, I am going to tell you one of them. Uh, the story of Justine Sacco. She was a PR woman in New York with 170 Twitter followers. Just before she boarded a plane from London to Cape Town, she tweeted, <laughs> I apologize in advance, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. And she chuckled to herself, pressed send, got no replies, felt that sad feeling that we all feel when the internet doesn't congratulate us for being funny. Got on the plane, turned off her phone, slept, and when she woke up in Cape Town, she turned on her phone, and straight away there was a text from somebody she hadn't spoken to since high school that said, I am so sorry to see what's happening to you right now. And then another text from her best friend, you need to call me right now. You are the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. When I met Justine a few weeks later, I asked her to explain her joke to me. She said, Living in America puts us in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what is going on in the third world. I was trying to make fun of that bubble. So her joke was actually intended to mock her own privilege. But she never got a chance to explain that to anybody because while she was asleep on a plane and oblivious to her destruction, Twitter took control of her life and tore it apart. It started with humanitarians. Tweets like, in the light of Justine Sacco's disgusting tweet, I am donating to care today. Then came the trolls. I'm actually kind of hoping that Justine Sacco gets AIDS, lol. Then came the calls for her to be fired. Thousands of people around the world decided it was their duty to get her fired. And she was fired while she slept. Somebody worked out exactly which plane she was on. And so they linked to a flight tracker website. And a hashtag started trending worldwide. Hashtag, has Justine landed yet? People tweeted, we're about to watch this Justine Sacco bitch get fired in real time before she even knows she's being fired. And it's kind of wild to see someone self-destruct without them even being aware of it. And seriously, I just want to go home to bed, but everybody at this bar is so into, has Justine landed yet? can't look away, can't leave. And hashtag has Justine landed yet, maybe the best thing to happen to my Friday night. And right, is there no one in Cape Town going to the airport to tweet her arrival? Come on, Twitter, I'd like pictures. And guess what? Yes, there was. Justine's name was normally Googled 40 times a month. That month, her name was Googled 1,220,000 times. Google and Twitter were making good money out of all of this, hundreds of thousands of dollars in ad revenue, whereas those of us doing the actual shaming, we got nothing. It's like we were unpaid shaming interns for Google and Twitter. There was no interest that night in waiting for her plane to land so she could explain the joke. Curiosity, waiting for evidence, was a weakness that night. Anyway, the Justine shaming was a super shaming. The violin woman was an everyday shaming. There'll be one just like it going on right now somewhere. Someone somewhere will be trying to fit in, but they'll do it awkwardly, and so a whole bunch of people will snarl at them. You're not good enough. You're not like us. Get out. The great thing about social media was how it gave a voice to voiceless people. 
but it's turning into a place where the smartest way to survive is to go back to being voiceless. And here's my story about open-mindedness. It begins in Hawaii in 2003. I was there to interview a special forces soldier called Glenn Wheaton. He'd been part of a secret 1980s military unit called Project Jedi. I didn't know anything about Project Jedi. I think that it had a name, Project Jedi, so I went to see him and I asked him what Project Jedi was. And he said, Project Jedi was a series of levels. So I said, what was level one? He said, level one was observation. You walk into a room, how many chairs are in the room? The super soldier would just know. So I said, what was level two? He said, level two was intuition. You were at a fork in the road. Do you go left? Do you go right? You go right. I said, what was level three? He said, level three was invisibility. I said, that's quite a leap from level two. I said, well, actual invisibility. He said, at first, but after a while, we adapted it to trying to find a way of not being seen. So I said, like camouflage, and he went, no. And level four, he said, was they had a master sergeant that could stop the heart of a goat just by wanting it to stop. So I said, did he ever manage it? And he said, one time, but his heart got damaged in the process. And I said, what, was the goat psychically fighting back? He said, no, the goat didn't stand a chance. He said, one time they had 30 goats in a room, and they put numbers on the goats' backs, and they were all staring at goat number 16, and goat number 17 fell over, which I guess is collateral damage. I see this as a positive and inspiring story about open-mindedness for three reasons. One, I'm pretty sure that they never actually managed to kill a goat just by staring at it. So we don't need to worry about cruelty to goats. My guess is that if you stare at a goat for long enough, it will eventually fall over, either through boredom or tiredness or coincidence. <laughs> Two, the goat starers were proud of their experiments, and for good reason. They figured that if they can't do crazy stuff like this on military bases, no one would ever try crazy stuff like this out. Isn't that what the military is for, thinking out of the box? Maybe in reaching for the impossible, something wonderful and possible would be discovered. Some new humane way of averting war or finding a superhuman power that we didn't know we had. The goat staring was radical open-mindedness. And you know where else thinking out of the box is encouraged? College. Three. When I first heard about the goat staring, I could have thought, I'm not going to listen to this crazy man. I could have been closed-minded like we so often are on social media. But instead, I was incredibly curious. During the months that followed, I tracked down the goat starer. Later, back at home, I was watching my interview with him when my wife came home. She was drunk. She watched the footage, then she said, you know what you should call your book? The Men Who Stare at Goats. So I did. When the book was published, word somehow got to George Clooney that there was a book out about the US military called The Men Who Stare at Goats. He was intrigued, so he read the book, liked it, and made a movie based on it. And as a result, every time I want to interview somebody nowadays, I can begin my email with, Hi, my name's John Ronson. You may be aware of my book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, which was turned into a movie starring George Clooney. <laughs> it always works. People give me interviews because everybody likes George Clooney. I got to write more books. By the way, if you're an aspiring writer, but you find writing unbearably hard and it's tearing you apart and you fear you have no talent, congratulations, you're a writer. <laughs> anyway, I spent my goat's movie windfall moving to New York. Being in New York gave me the idea to write my public shaming book. And that's why I ended up right here at this lectern in this beautiful college looking at all of your amazing faces. On social media, we are like drone strike operators who don't need to think about the village that we've just blown up. We're like snowflakes who don't need to feel responsible for the avalanche. But when we're together, as humans, we're nice. 
I once met a man called Mike Hubacek. In 1996, when he was 18, he was driving drunk at 100 miles an hour with no headlights when he crashed into a minivan. Two people were killed. Instead of sending him to prison, the judge sentenced him to carry a sign once a month for 10 years in front of high schools and bars that read, I killed two people while driving drunk. I didn't expect him to say it, but he told me that his public shaming was the best thing that had ever happened to him. When I asked him why, he said it was because the onlookers had been so nice. He'd feared abuse and ridicule, but no, 90% of the responses on the streets were, God bless you, and things will be okay, and you poor thing, come with me to church. This was in Texas. <laughs> Their kindness meant everything, he said to me. It made it all right. It set him on his path to salvation. College is a place to be empathetic and to be curious. Find your people. Find other people who aren't your people, but you might learn something from them anyway. Find your voice and have an amazing time. Thank you. Hang on. Hang on. Very nice. That was fabulous. Don't leave. Hang on. So thank you, John, for your remarks this evening wow. uh, for our freshman convocation. Thank you for taking the time to be here and also for taking the time to sign copies of your book after uh, this ceremony is over. And in appreciation, we have this very nice memento from CSUN. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. Thank you. Oh, oh, it's heavy. Ah, ah, it is heavy. I'm going to it. Yes. Thank you. Can I just say this is an especially nice gift to have because I feel under-awarded in life, so it's always nice to get some oh. awards. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> well, I don't know about you all, but I like George Clooney too. <laughs> so, at this time I would like to ask the entire platform party to please stand, and I'm inviting Associated Students President Savag Alexanian to come forward. Welcome again to all the new matadors. So I was told that during the summer you've all been working hard and at orientation ses sessions learning about the CSUN alma mater. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I, I hear some in the crowd, okay. Um, if you haven't memorized all of the words yet, not to worry, uh, they are listed in your program if you look in the back. Um, I think we also have arranged a little assistance for you. Orientation leaders, are you ready? Jazz A Band, are you ready? I think we all heard them, okay. Freshmen, are you ready? One more time, I don't think I can hear you. Freshmen, are you ready? All right, now if I may ask you all, everybody, to now stand for this very special performance of the CSUN alma mater. May this be a wonderful memory of your freshman convocation. Matadors, let's sing out loud. Hail to the Matadors.
Before we conclude, please allow me to acknowledge and thank the many persons who've helped make this event possible. Of course, Professor Matt Harris and the CSUN Jazz A Band and the brass musicians from our music department, members of our campus staff who organized tonight's ceremony, and our new student orientation leaders and student housing residents assistants who've worked so hard to prepare you for your freshman year ahead. I would, write, I would like to ask all of our new student orientation leaders and resident advisors to please stand and accept our gratitude. And finally, thank you to the members of our Freshman Convocation Committee. It is my hope that tonight's convocation has given you, our freshman class, a greater insight into the opportunities which lie ahead of you here at CSUN. I also hope that tonight's convocation has nurtured your commitment and desire to succeed and has helped to instill a sense of matador pride within you. I now invite each of you to put on your new matador pin and walk up the library stairs with us as we begin our reception in the library portico. You now join CSUN's community of scholars who share a deep commitment to gaining knowledge and using it to help shape a better world for all of us. My very best wishes to each and every one of you for your success here at CSUN. I now conclude this freshman convocation. <laughs>